Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome to Royal Air Force Mount Pleasant, Britain's most remote military outpost, located deep in the heart of the bustling cosmopolitan metropolis that are the Falkland Islands. I've been down here three, maybe four times. Always with the Navy, obviously. I wouldn't go here by choice. Um, <laughs> oh no. Um twice actually deployed to the garrison and once in a warship six month tours each time so i've actually spent a year and a half of my life in the falcon islands and it wasn't actually that bad i mean you have to put it in the context nobody expects glitz glamour fine whining and dining in the falcon islands but when you go down there with extremely low expectations it's actually not that bad just trying to get my bearings here. It's been a really long time since I was last in this place. The whole purpose of the garrison and the Royal Air Force airfield is to keep open the air bridge to the UK. What's the air bridge? Well, basically it's a complete waste of time and money trying to keep a whole bunch of tanks and artillery and engineers and infantry permanently garrisoning this place in the event that Argentina decides to get a little bit frisky again as it did in 1982. So instead it was decided to stockpile all of the tanks and artillery and all of the heavy military equipment down here but fly the personnel required to operate them down in the event of hostilities outbreaking and Royal Air Force Mount Pleasant's sole purpose is to keep that air bridge open. Ensure that the transport aircraft delivering the personnel who are going to operate all of the heavy military equipment make it through. This by the way is called 38 facility. It's where I lived on the two occasions when I was garrisoned down here. The large building on the left, that's the uh, I think that's the NAFI complex and dining hall. The first time I was down here there were extremely limited facilities. They just built a pretty well equipped gymnasium but other than that there was nothing. Oh and there are no tower blocks down here by the way. This is just uh, Microsoft Flight Sim having a best guess at what these buildings actually are. Now while there were extremely limited facilities that doesn't mean that there was nothing to do. Because every unit that made up the garrison had its own private unit bar. So when you were down in the Falkland Islands, at least on the first occasion when I was there, there were only really two things to do. Either go to the gym and get very, very fit, or become an alcoholic. <laughs> um, yeah, most people went for option two. I, however, on my first deployment to the Falklands, because I didn't really drink. I was a radio operator at the time, working at the communications centre in the Joint Operations Centre. And I got so bored after my first month, I actually started going to the gym. And I'm real glad I did. Before I explain why, I should probably explain what the composition of the garrison at Royal Air Force Mount Pleasant consists of. And it's mostly Air Force, so there's very little actual military presence. At the time, I think the garrison consisted of around 2,000 people, and about 1,500 of them were Air Force, because it takes 1,500 Air Force to keep four aircraft flying. At the time when I was in the Falklands, those four aircraft were a single flight of Panavia Tornadoes, although they have since been replaced with Eurofighter Typhoons. Like I said, the whole point of the garrison is to keep that air bridge open, and you need fighter interceptors to do that. Of the remaining 500 personnel in the garrison, you did have some actual military. Around about 400 to 450 army, including a resident infantry company, the only actual soldiers, although the army will get upset because everybody in the army is a soldier first and a whatever else second, but you know what I mean. One company of infantry rotated on a regular basis with other infantry companies from the UK, and then a whole bunch of associated army personnel, including Royal Engineers, Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, uh, Logistics Corps, you get the idea. Topped off with slightly less than 50 sailors, of whom I was one. And honestly, being a sailor down there was great. 
because nobody understood what my rank insignia meant. <laughs> so just to be safe, everybody saluted me. Now, one of the Royal Engineers who was down in the Falklands at the same time that I was there was, I cannot remember his name, he was a great guy, and he was a corporal in the Royal Engineers. And the Royal Engineers, it turns out, actually have something of a tradition of fencing, sword fighting, sabre, foil, epée, that kind of thing. And this Royal Engineer Corporal was probably just as bored as I was, so he started doing fencing lessons. And I turned up at the gym, bored out of my mind, and thought, what the hell, I'll give it a go. And you know what? It was great. I really enjoyed it. I really looked forward to going to my fencing lessons whenever I wasn't on watch in the communication centre. And I turned out to be reasonably good at it. I'm not saying Olympic gold medalist here or anything, but I was definitely his most promising student. I wasn't very good with the sabre. Uh, I loved the epée, but I was very good with the foil. So he decided he was going to organise a fencing tournament. And he was doing it for one reason and one reason only. There was a Royal Air Force Corporal, who I believe was the Royal Air Force fencing champion. And this Air Force champion was far too good and fancy to bother turning up to this uh, Royal Engineers Corporal's fencing club. Basically, these two guys absolutely detested each other. But the Engineer Corporal knew that if he did a fencing tournament, the Air Force Corporal would turn up just so he could win it and lord it over all of the Engineer Corporal's students, because that's just the kind of wanker he was. And the Engineer Corporal knew that this was exactly what was going to happen. In fact, he was counting on it, because he had a secret weapon. And that secret weapon was me. No, no, don't laugh. There was a method to his madness. You see, these two Corporals knew each other. They didn't like each other, but they knew each other. They knew each other's strengths, they knew each other's weaknesses. But the Air Force Corporal didn't know me, because I'd only been training for two months before this tournament was organised. And so the Engineer Corporal didn't so much train me to be good at fencing, he just trained me to beat the Air Force Corporal. He knew his strengths, he knew his weaknesses, and he trained me to defend against his strengths and to exploit his weaknesses. The Air Force Corporal, of course, had no such advantage, because... I was a nobody. I'd never fought before. So on the day of the tournament, and the engineer corporal had organised the tournament and was also judging the tournament, and the commander, British Forces Falcon Islands, was present, handing out the prizes. And when I came to fight this Air Force corporal using the foil, the engineer would tell me specifically what to do. So for the first bout, he told me to play defensive because the Air Force Corporal thought, who's this nobody, I'll just smash him. And I did, and I took the first point. Just frustrated his attack, and then when he left himself open, I took the hit. The Engineer Corporal then told me he's going to be frustrated now. So, on the second bout, just there's a fencing move called a flash, and it basically, it's just a 100% all-out attack. You just launch yourself at your opponent, and if they can't get out of the way you're going to hit them. But if they can get out of the way, you are completely vulnerable and open. But of course he wasn't expecting me to do this, and the Engineer Corporal knew that, which is why he told me to do it, and I took the second point. So it's now match point, and this Air Force Corporal was not happy. <laughs> not happy at all, and didn't even try to hide it. And of course now he's rattled, because it's match point, and he's about to lose to a nobody. So he is going to go for the all-out attack, which is what the Engineer Corporal told me to expect. And again, I was able to defend against his attack and then slip the point of my foil in uh, when he overextended himself. And I took the third point in the match and won the tournament. <laughs> and this Air Force Corporal, I've never seen such a bad loser in my life. He literally threw his sword down and stormed off. <laughs> it was fantastic. And this army corporal, when I won, because he couldn't show any impartiality because he was judging. <laughs> he was just standing there, hands behind his back, in his sports blazer and tie, 
with this little smile on his face. And I just knew he was thinking, that's my boy. <laughs> so that was fun. Oh, this, by the way, this is what you get when the Air Force design a facility that has to be defended by ground forces. That, right outside the perimeter of the camp. That is the Headquarters, Operations Centre and Communications Centre buildings. And that's where I worked in my first tour of duty in the Falkland Islands. I was a radio operator at the time and I worked in the Communications Centre. There was an Air Force Corporal on the opposite shift to mine. Again, I can't remember his name, but he was a really nice guy. And between the two of us, we looked after the communication centre cat. There's a lot of cats in the garrison, because there are a lot of rats in the garrison, and the feral cats keep the rat population down. The cat in the Comsen, we called her Furburger, or just Burger for short. And the Air Force Corporal and I, because we were on opposite shifts, would take it in turns to look after and feed her. She was a lovely ginger tabby. And the only two people she would allow anywhere near her were myself and this Air Force Corporal. So every time I turned up for a shift in the Consen, I'd bring a can of tuna. She really was a great cat. She had kittens when I was down there as well. No idea what happened to them, because I left shortly after she gave birth. So that was my first tour of duty in the Falkland Islands garrison. That would have probably been around about 1993. I flew down there right after I'd spent six months as gate security at the Naval Air Station. Oh, what was it called? The one in Somerset. Yeovilton, that's it. It's where the Fleet Air Arm Museum is. Fantastic museum, by the way. Definitely worth a visit. My second tour of duty down in the Falklands was after I'd branch transferred to the writer branch, so no longer working in the communication centre, doing shifts. Instead, working a day job in the unit admin flight. And that was all right. Not that the job was good, it wasn't. It was as dull as dishwater. It was my job to keep an accurate tally on the comings and goings of the various different military personnel that made up the garrison. So there was a database listing every member of the military in the garrison what their parent unit back in the UK was, all of their details, which unit they worked for down here in the Falklands, when they were due to leave, you know, all of that stuff. Every time a flight came in with new personnel, they went through me, took all of their details and then sent them on to their units. And the same for when people left. I say in theory, because in practice, let's just say that the personnel database hadn't been maintained as well as it probably should have and this is going to sound hard to believe, but we didn't actually know for sure who was in the garrison and who wasn't. In fact, the situation got so bad, there was an army staff sergeant working over in the headquarters building, uh, and between he and I, we made it our business to physically go around every unit in the garrison, checking that they had who we thought they had, and often they didn't because this was the only way to fix the personnel database to ensure that the people who were in the garrison were the people who were supposed to be in the garrison. I know this is going to sound hard to believe. Everybody seems to think that, you know, running with military efficiency is a thing, but there's nothing efficient about military efficiency. <laughs> um, and this job with this army staff sergeant, he was a great guy, and again, whose name I can't remember, he got promoted to warrant officer while I was down there, um, this job took us ooh, at least three months. But it was it was all right, because it meant that I got out of the unit admin flight office and got to drive around the garrison, meeting people every day. Oh, and that was something that was actually kind of funny as well. Because remember, most of the personnel in the garrison at Royal Air Force Mount Pleasant were Army or Air Force. Something like 98, 98.5% were Army and Air Force. There were less than 50 Navy personnel there. And I was one of them. And so, of course, all of these soldiers and airmen, they didn't have a clue what my rank insignia meant. So we're driving around in a jeep, but I don't have a driving licence. So there's a staff sergeant driving me around in a jeep. And every time we came to a checkpoint, the poor sods on the gate would like, what? who is that? <laughs> He's being driven around by a staff sergeant. He must be important. So I was getting all the salutes. <laughs> The staff sergeant thought it was hilarious, of course, because it was. <laughs> At first, I would try to explain to everybody that they didn't have to salute me. 
The staff sergeant soon put a stop to that because he thought it was funny. <laughs> And honestly, it was much faster to just return the salute and drive on. Another good thing about my second tour down the Falcons was... Uh, well, how can I put this? I was an able rate at the time. But I was in a leading rate's job. So I was being paid as a leading rate. Plus, because I'd spent so much time at sea in the Navy, I was... There's this thing called LSSB, Longer Service at Sea Bonus. And... I qualified for the 10-year rate. They just changed the way it worked. And because I'd spent so long at sea, I was basically being paid. I think they called it separation pay at the time. Not sure. But basically, I qualified for the 10-year rate. The highest paid rate of this separation bonus. So not only was I being paid one rank higher than I was, I was also collecting the highest rate of this separation bonus for being down the Falklands. Which meant that, in effect, I was getting paid more than the sergeants. <laughs> Oh, which was nice. In fact, and because there was nothing to do down there, you just, you either got drunk and blew all of your money on beer, or you saved money. And so I saved thousands during that six-month tour. I mean, they had, in the time since I was first down the Falklands, improved the facilities. There was, um, you could buy pizza. There was a bowling alley. They even had a sort of little cinema. It was good but you still couldn't spend a huge amount of money unless you were going on a bender and getting absolutely blasted drunk every night. And, of course, I didn't really drink that much. So I came back from the Falklands loaded and was able to pay off all of my debts. You see, when I first joined the Navy, I was young and stupid, and I got horribly into debt. Long story short, for my first 10 years in the Navy, between 1989 and 1999, most of what I earned every month in my pay packet went to paying off my debts. However, this one six-month trip down the Falklands, because there was nothing to spend the money on, I came back with so much cash, didn't hurt, of course, that I was being paid one rank higher than I was, plus getting the 10-year rate of separation pay, I was able to pay off all of my debts and still have a few thousand left over, which meant that suddenly, because I wasn't paying off loans every month, it was as if I'd been promoted two ranks when I came back from the Falklands. So that one six-month deployment really turned my life around. There was slightly more to do in the Falklands on my second deployment than on the first one. I mean, in the first one, it was literally go to a different unit bar every night or go to the gym. That was it. By the time I'd made my second deployment to the Falklands as a writer, they'd spent a bit more money on personnel facilities. There was a bowling alley... The Naffy shop had been expanded, so it actually looked like a shop where you could buy things. There were a couple of burger bars scattered around. There was a small cinema. In fact, I saw Blade 2 for the first time in the Falcon Islands, and it wasn't a terrible little cinema. I mean, it wasn't actually a cinema. It was just a room with a white wall and a bunch of seats and a film projector, but it was better than nothing. Just off the south dispersal area of the airfield, they built a go-kart track. Um, they even had a paintball site down there. You wouldn't want to play in winter because getting hit by frozen paintballs is not fun, but, you know, it's it was a far cry from what was there the first time I'd been there, just five or six years earlier. So it wasn't that bad. But for many people, the high point was still getting the opportunity to visit Port Stanley. And honestly, I have no idea why. <laughs> For a start, it was a good hour and a half drive away. And, well, Port Stanley, what can I say? Are you ready for the bright lights of the big city? Because here it is, we are approaching Port Stanley now. That's it. Two pubs, and I think the military are barred from one of the pubs. One restaurant and a cafe. That's it. Population 2000. I still like to go to Port Stanley once a week if I could, because they had a supermarket there that wasn't great, but it did at least sell things that you couldn't get at the Naffy. Certainly not legally, if you were a junior rating. I could buy a bottle of whiskey, a couple of bottles of wine, some cheese that didn't taste of plastic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> All those little things that you couldn't get in the Naffy shop back on the garrison. At least not legally, and not as a junior rating. And... I mean, nobody bothered searching your bags when you came back on board. Security was, well, I was going to say lax. It wasn't even lax. It was non-existent. The bus that take you back to the garrison 
the, uh, the driver would check everybody's ID cards when they got onto the bus, and then when the bus got back to the garrison, they would just get waved through. It was down to the driver to ensure that there were only military personnel on board, and honestly, you can kind of see why. I mean, we're in the Falkland Islands. It wasn't as if the IRA were going to try to set a bomb off in the Falklands, was it? In fact, security down here was so lax that before you could go back to the UK, you had to attend a security lecture just to remind everybody that you were actually in the military <laughs> and security was something that you're supposed to take seriously. So, yeah, I, I did actually enjoy my time in the Falklands, although I'm in no great rush to go back. Although some people are, because there are cruise liners that visit Port Stanley. I am not making this shit up, right? People pay thousands and thousands and thousands to go to the Falkland Islands on a cruise liner. Personally, I don't mind revisiting Microsoft Flight Sim, but that's about as close as I want to get. Oh, that's Akazuki telling me we're done for the day. I hope you enjoyed it, and as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.